right, well, hey, good morning. Uh, for those of you who may not know, my name's Robbie Cooper. I'm the senior minister here at Gateway, um, and I'm excited for today. Um, if, you're, if you're here and you just, like, happen to wander in as a guest today, like of all the days you could have chosen to come, it just happened to be today, and you have no idea what's going on, you're actually kind of in for a treat. Um, right after service, uh, we're going to be doing a couple of interesting things. One is going to be a chili cook-off, and so even if you didn't bring food, like we just want you to hang out with us um, and enjoy some good chili. Uh, it's going to be a great time. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, and then after that, we're going to have a, a trunk or treat event. Uh, we got a whole bunch of people from the community that we're expecting to stop by, plus kids from our own congregation. Um, and really, it's just a way for us to demonstrate the love of Jesus, to provide smiling faces in a welcoming place. Uh, for, for kids in our community. And so we're excited for that. That's going to happen after the chili cook-off from 1 to 3. Um, but actually, the, the thing that I want to let you guys know about the most uh, today is, is something that's actually happening in a couple weeks. Um, is for those of you, whether you call this church your, your like church family, your home or not, uh, we would love to invite you on November 8th. Uh, it's a Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock. We're going to be having our Thanksgiving dinner. Um, and it's a little bit earlier than, uh, than previous years, but we are, we're going to be having our Thanksgiving dinner on um, Wednesday, November 8th at 6 o'clock. And really, we want to invite you. We want, we want this to be an opportunity for our church family to come together, but also we want it to be something where if you have... Uh, you have other family members in town or you have uh, people that you know, especially if you have someone in your life that you know um, that, that they're not going to be able to be around family or friends uh, for Thanksgiving this year and you want to help provide a place for them to, to celebrate together with some people, we would love for you to bring them. So November 8th, we're doing our Thanksgiving dinner right here at the church. Um, we'd love for people to sign up to, to bring a dish to, to help with that. Uh, you can do that on the Church Center app. Um, and in particular, we're looking for a few people um, to, to sign up to be willing to cook a turkey or a ham. Is it the church will provide the turkey or the ham? Uh, we just need some people with ovens to, to cook them. And so if that sounds like something you'd be interested in doing uh, specifically for the turkeys and hams, please talk to Mary Johnson or you can talk to myself or any of the staff members and just let us know you're willing to do that and we'll arrange um, to, to make that happen. So, so that it's exciting. Uh, make sure you sign up on the Church Center app. This is Thanksgiving dinner coming up in just a couple weeks on November 8th. That being said, let's, let's pray one more time, uh, and then we'll, we'll jump into what we're talking about this morning. Uh, Father, we love you, and we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the opportunity we have uh, to dive into your word this morning. To thank you so much for, for the worship that we've enjoyed and, and the time of um, gathering around the Lord's table together and, and the fellowship that happens there. God, we thank you for that, but we also pray that you'd be with us now as we dive into your word. God, would you would you open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to what it is you have to say to us this morning? God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we've been in this series for the last several weeks. This is week four of our series that we're calling Influencers, and, and this series is all about how do we lead people to Jesus? Because part of our mission of our it's part of our mission as a church. Our mission as a church is to love, lead, and to live like Jesus. Uh, and so th this whole series is focused around that that middle idea in the in the mission statement. There, that what does it mean? What does it look like for us to lead like Jesus? And so as we've gone through this series, as much as this series is, is for us, each person here as an individual, this is also kind of a vision series for our church. Uh, the, the first two weeks of the series, we talked about what does it look like for us as a church to lead the next generation to Jesus. And, and that has implications for each of us as individuals, but we're really talking about as a church. Uh, how can we do this better? And then last week, we began exploring how can our church lead different neglected groups to Christ. That, that throughout society, there, there are some groups of people that kind of typically are on the margins of society, maybe forgotten in some areas, uh, in some different ways. And, and how can we, with the love of Jesus, reach out to those people and help them know about the Savior that, that loves them and died for them? And so specifically, last week, we talked about kids who, who need a family and, and that, that the church can provide that family through foster care and adoption and being involved in that. And today, the, the group that we're talking about today um, is, is really maybe the most obvious. Like if, when you think of neglected people groups uh, in, in normal everyday society, this is probably the one that, that you think about. See, today we're talking about the poor. And I say that this is the most obvious group because if you're a Christian especially, 
you're probably well aware that as, as believers in Christ, we are called to care for the poor. It is all over the Bible. You probably just didn't even realize quite how much. Like you knew it was an important thing, but you maybe didn't realize how much it's in the Bible. A famous American theologian named Jonathan Edwards, um, he, he, he said something, and this, he is not a preacher. He's not like a lot of preachers that, that tend to exaggerate their words and how every single week what we're talking about is the most important thing. Like, he's not that type of preacher. He's a guy who's very, very measured in his word choice and, and very careful not to overstate or to understate things. And, uh, and so that was kind of what characterized Jonathan Edwards. And so it's interesting that he said this, about the poor. He said, where have we any command in the Bible laid down in stronger terms or in a more peremptory, urgent manner than the command to give to the poor? Now, if you heard that quote and you're like me, you're like, what in the world does peremptory mean? Oh, well, I had to look it up too. Uh, so I looked it up in the dictionary. This is what it means. It means insisting on immediate attention or obedience. So basically what Jonathan Edwards is saying there, he's saying, look, if there is anything in scripture that is clear, that is like absolutely crystal clear, Christians must do this. If there's any single command from God that we are supposed to do, it is to care for the poor, to give to the poor. Now that may, that may be a little surprising to some of you, because some of you are like, well, what about the command to love? Aren't we supposed to love one another? We talk about love all of the time, and you're right. Throughout the New Testament, love is definitely the dominant command that we see over and over and over. But if you take all of Scripture together, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, together with the New Testament, it's actually the command to, to care for the poor that shows up the most. See, I, it's interesting that, that that shows up so often. Jonathan Edwards, that quote, that quote that I just read a little bit ago, it struck me because when, you, when, I, when I hear people in church or I hear Christian people talk about the poor, I don't hear them talk about it that way. The, the, most of the time when we talk about the poor, we hear it put out there as, well, it's an option, that it's good to do, that yes, the church should care for the poor, but it's, it's kind of put out there as like, one of a whole lot of different good things that we should be doing. And so sometimes we can focus on that, and sometimes we focus on other things. It's like, almost like it like should be a department of the church. Like, it, like it's, a, it's a committee that you can choose to sit on this committee, or you can choose to not sit on the committee. But, but it's, it's a thing that we do, but it's not that central. See, but Jonathan Edwards was saying that, look, this is the clearest this is the most obvious command in Scripture. It's one of the clearest things that every single Christian should be doing. And yet our tendency, our tendency today is to try and, and screen it out, to, 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 to kind of relegate it to just an option of something that, that we can do. One of the clearest examples of this um, is actually seen in the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe you're familiar with, with Jesus' most famous sermon. It's, this, this sermon is clearly something that, that he preached more than one time. We hear it recorded in two different places in, in the Gospels. It's in the Gospel of Matthew, but it's also recorded in the Gospel of Luke. And the reason that we think that it was probably preached several times, maybe even more than just those two times, is because the wording is just a little bit different uh, in, in those two different accounts. And one of them's called, in Matthew, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke, it's actually called the Sermon on the Plain. But both of them, it's understood by scholars that, that both of them kind of summarize material that Jesus likely taught fairly regularly. But what's interesting about it as it relates to this idea of talking about the poor is that if you're familiar with that sermon and you're familiar with the very opening line of it, it talks specifically about the poor. And yet when we think about it, Matthew's version is way more popular. Matthew's version says something along the lines of, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we like that idea of being poor in spirit because it's, it's, it's metaphorical. And we can handle that. But when you look at Luke's version, it's a, it's a little bit, I don't know if I want to say that, a little bit more scary. This is, what, this is how Luke writes it in, in Luke chapter 6, verse 20. Looking at his disciples, he, meaning Jesus, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. 
And throughout the rest of the, of the Sermon on the Plain that Luke records there, he, he, he goes on to contrast the rich with the poor. And so Luke's version, Luke's version of the, the opening of this sermon, it contrasts the haves and the have-nots, which honestly can make us uncomfortable. Because when we hear it put that way, not blessed are the poor in spirit, which could relate to anyone who's ever gone through anything difficult, but when it focuses in on, on blessed are the poor, it makes us uncomfortable because that, that can't be allegorized away. That can't be spiritualized away. It can't be metaphorized away. There's no out. We can't find a way to let ourselves off the hook. See, I can, make, I can easily make poor in spirit include me. But when we're talking about just plain poor, well, likely for most, most of the people here today, that requires us to turn our attention to a group that, that we may not be a part of. And it causes us to recognize that the poor are blessed in God's eyes. It forces us to evaluate their dignity on a level that is on par with, with ourselves. And suddenly, Jesus' instructions to love your neighbor as yourself take on kind of new meaning. See, this idea, this blessed are the poor, this wasn't new teaching that Jesus was introducing. Actually, it was kind of a summary statement that really summarizes about 200 different verses from the Hebrew Bible, Found it's from 200 different verses about the poor from the Old Testament. See, God had already given his people very detailed instructions on how they were to care for the poor. In fact, he told them over and over and over that they were actually to be a light to the nations because, and he said, look, because in your community, you are going to take care of the widows and the poor and the orphans. That, that basically, he was telling them there's going to be, there should be no poor among you if you do the things that I say. And so he gives them some laws, some specific laws that they were supposed to follow in order to bring this all about. Things like... Um, no one in the Israelite community was allowed to harvest their fields to the very edges of the field. They had to leave the crops around the edges of the field. They couldn't harvest them for themselves. And the reason was they had to leave it there for the poor so that the poor could come by and harvest a little bit for themselves. It was a way to provide for the poor. It's kind of like God's social security plan. There's another thing. Uh, every three years, uh, everyone in, in the land of Israel was required to give an extra tithe. They always gave 10% of what they harvested, but, but every third year they were requir required to give an, another 10%. And that extra offering every third year went to the poor. And then every seventh year, there was a Sabbath year where you couldn't harvest your own land at all. And it was left for the poor. And there were all kinds of different commands like this in, in, in Israel's law with God. They, 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 he gave them all kinds of commands of how, specifically, they were, to, they were to care for the poor. Maybe the most famous example comes in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 7 and 8. This is what is written. It says, If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. See, God's telling the people there, hey, look, if there's, a, if there's a fellow Israelite, if there is someone who is a part of your faith community and they are in need, it was the responsibility of God's people to address that need. And look what it says there. It says to, to freely lend to them whatever they need. The implication there is to, to lend to them until that need is no longer a need. Not just contribute a little bit to it and kind of help them out. It, take, take care of that need. Make it, make it go away. See, caring for the poor has always been a focus of God's people. And ga God gave them specific laws about exactly how to do that. And to be clear, they never actually did it. Like, like the, the, the Jewish people uh, during the, that time, they never actually followed God's commands the way that they were supposed to in this area. They, they didn't actually carry it out. But they were supposed to. 
And then, and then Jesus came. And things changed when Jesus came on the scene. After the resurrection, those, those Old Testament laws, they, they were no longer in place because Jesus had fulfilled the previous covenant with God. See, what it, had, what it took to be a part of the people of God, it shifted away from being an, an ethnic and a religious identity, and it shifted toward including anyone who chose to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. And the way that, that, that more inclusive people of God were to relate to the poor, well, that began to shift as well. Not only were they to care for the poor that was within their people group, but that care was then to be extended to all people with the specific requirements, or with, while those specific requirements that had been there about how they were supposed to do it, those were no longer in place. The who of caring for the poor was expanded to include more. And the how was expanded because it no longer ex was explicitly spelled out by you have to do it exactly this way. See, the Old, Old Testament Israel, they had been pres a very prescribed response that honestly they, they had refused to do it. Whereas now, as the church, as the current people of God, the followers of God, we have freedom in Christ to explore how we are best to care for the poor. And to be honest, we have been debating the how ever since. Like, like we, we all pretty much agree on the who. We all understand that we're called to provide for the poor, but we get hung up on the how. We, we, we disagree over what is the best way for that to happen. You may have really strong feelings about what is the best way, what's the best how to care for the poor. There are not just individuals, there are groups that have really strong opinions. Often our how is shaped maybe more by our political affiliation or through the media that we consume than it is by the word of God. And it's okay to have strong feelings about how we should care for the poor. But... It becomes a problem when we let our difference of opinion on how to minister, well, when we allow that to slow or to stop our progress in actually providing for the poor, it becomes a problem. When we get hung up on the how, the who suffer. And you see this in government all the time. But to be honest, the, the church should be better than that. In my opinion, the, the church too often, we have allowed government to step into this area of caring for the poor when we should be taking care of it ourselves. And, and while we are not perfect, I, I can say this about our church, about Gateway Christian Church. This is actually one of the strengths of our church, is that we do a pretty good job of caring for the poor, and we do a good job of doing it in, in hows, various hows, various ways, a lot of different ways. It looks looks differently. We 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 care for individuals um, by things like dropping the bucket and by providing benevolence when people are in difficult situations. We, sometimes we we provide for um, the poor in in various groups with, through some of our support for for organizations like YAPAC or or for Meals on Wheels. Sometimes we focus on relief efforts by supporting things like Loaves and Fishes or World Compassion Network. Other way, times, we focus on, on the how of development, that we want to, to teach people and help them develop skills and, and things like that that will set them on a course to, to maybe come out of poverty or to avoid poverty. And so we focus on development through things like supporting Hope Pregnancy Center or, or, or FAME, which, which supports healthcare around the world. See, I'm so glad to be a part of a church that serves the poor without getting hung up on the how. But if that's going to continue, if that's going to continue as a church, and to be honest, if we're going to get better at it, we can't lose sight of the why. We, we've talked about the who, we've talked about the how, but we cannot lose sight of the why. Why does God call us to care for the poor? Now, it might sound like kind of a silly question, but trust me, when you understand the why, the how gets done, and the who don't suffer. When you understand the why, the how gets done, and the who don't suffer. And so we're, we're going to spend the rest of our time this morning examining why God asks us to provide for the poor. And to be honest, I'll just give you the why up front. The reason we do it is because God personally identifies with the poor. 
God personally identifies with the poor. You'll see what I mean here in a second. Uh, there, there's two verses from the book of Proverbs that really sum up a whole lot. Uh, I mentioned there's over 200 verses in the Old Testament about serving the poor and about caring for the poor. Um, these two verses from Proverbs sum up a whole lot of them. And so we're going to look at them kind of side by side. The first one is this, Proverbs 19, 17. And this, this is what's written there. Proverbs 19, 17 says, Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. He's saying, look, if you're kind to the poor, God takes that as if you are being kind to him. And then you see the flip side in Proverbs uh, 14, verse 31, where it says this. It's kind of the opposite. It says, whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, and whoever is kind to the needy honors God. It says, if you show contempt for the poor, you're showing contempt for God. Kind of works like this. Um, maybe I can compare it to this. One of the more, more notorious banking practices that, is, that have happened in our, in our country is, is a thing called redlining. It's where, where a, a bank will take a look at a, um, a, a certain neighborhood, um, and, and typically that neighborhood is related to the poor. Sometimes it's racially um, segregated, things like that. And they will basically, they will draw kind of a red box around a particular neighborhood. And their policy is, is that they will not lend mortgage loans or small business loans to someone who lives within that neighborhood. And, and they justify it like this. They, they justify it by saying, well, they, they basically, they say, they're, we're simply looking at the statistics, and we've come to understand that the residents of those neighborhoods are more likely to not be able to make good on the loan. But these verses that we just read make it pretty clear that God says we are not to live that way in our relationship with the poor. See, in those two verses we looked at, God is basically saying, don't you dare redline people. Don't, don't look at someone and say, if I get involved with that person, I might get taken advantage of. God understands a gift to the, to the poor as being a gift to him. And he's saying, I will make good on the loan. Trust me. It's not a, not a promise of like literal dollars that he's going to send your way. But it is a promise to enrich your life and to meet your needs. Right, but there's a deeper principle at work in those verses too. It's talked about how if you insult the poor, you insult God. God identifies very closely with the poor, with the widow, with the orphan, with the immigrant, with the most powerless and the vulnerable in our society. And so when the, when the Old Testament points that out, that God identifies with the poor, it's a pretty strong statement. But it's still just kind of a figure of speech. Like it, it's something that sounds good, but, but what does that actually mean in everyday life? Well, I want you to consider how it literally came to life when Jesus came into the world. Proverbs, those verses tell us of God identifying with the poor symbolically. But through the incarnation of Jesus, Jesus coming into the world as a human being and living amongst us, it shows us God ident identifying with the poor literally. He was born in a feed trough. When his parents went to the temple to have him circumcised, their offering at the temple was, was a specific type of offering that was reserved for the poorest families. He lived among the poor and among the marginalized. He was homeless. At the end of his life, he rode into Jerusalem on a borrowed donkey, spent his last evening in a borrowed room, and was buried in a borrowed tomb. Roman soldiers, they, they, they cast lots for his only possession, his robe because he had been stripped naked on the cross. Jesus died naked and penniless. He had very little that the world valued, and what little he had was taken, and he was discarded by the world. And yet through him, we have hope. See, Jesus himself, he, he taught about the way he, he taught about the way that, that he personally identified with the poor. They, they, he tells a, a story, he, he, tells, uh, he has a teaching in Matthew 25 that gives us this picture of how Jesus in particular identifies with the poor. He gives this teaching, and he's talking specifically in this teaching about what it's going to be like at the final judgment. When, when Jesus returns and God comes to judge the world, 
He's teaching about what it's going to be like when everyone is called to account for their sins before God. And this is what he teaches in Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 31. It says, When the Son of Man comes in all his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And so basically he separates all the people of the world. He separates them into two groups. And, and he refers to one as sheep. The sheep represent those who, who have a right relationship with God and, and who will live with him eternally in the new creation. And the goats represent those who have rejected him and, and who will face eternity apart from his perfect and holy and life-giving presence. But I want you to pay close attention to what is revealed about each group that the person that they belong to. Look, pay close attention to, to the specific characteristic that reveals which group a person will find themselves in. Jesus goes on in, in verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. God, again, identifies himself with the poor. He's saying, look, if you, if you did any of these things for, the, for these people, then you did it for me. And the people who were rewarded here, that Jesus is trying to reward, they... They, they don't understand. See, those who are rewarded are, are those who have cared for, their poor, for the poor, but it wasn't their care that earned them this standing. And the reason we know that this isn't like a works-based salvation thing where, where people care for the poor and therefore God lets them into heaven, the reason we know it's not that way is because look at their response in verse 37. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? They didn't do it to earn a reward. They had cared for these people just out of compassion. Their motive, the, the, them asking this question about, hey, we didn't even realize we did this. When did we do this? Them asking that question, it, 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 it eliminates the possibility of hypocrisy. It eliminates the possibility that they were helping others so they could actually get something for themselves instead. And it ensures that they were actually acting with the heart of God. So Jesus responds to him in verse 40. The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. God identifies with the poor. He takes the way we treat them personally. And when we care for them, it brings reward. Not because we've earned it, but because it reveals something about us. But to be true, it, it can, the, our response to the poor can also bring judgment. The goats are characterized as those who, who fail to meet the needs of the poor. Look at the next verses, verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. See, the king will, will go to those people, and he'll say, Hey, you did not provide for me when you had the chance. And their response is kind of understandable. Verse 44, they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or, or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison? When, when did we see that and, and did not help you? He will reply, reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. See, they're, they protest. They're like, hey, when did we see? We, we don't remember seeing you hungry or thirsty or naked or sick or in prison. The implication being there, if we had, we would have done something. 
we would have responded the right way if we had known that, that this is what the test was. If we had known that this was you, we would have responded the right way. What's interesting is that the sheep, they responded the same way, but in reverse. They said, we don't remember doing these things. When did that happen? When do we see you in need? And the answer to both of their questions is on the cross. That's where we see how far God was willing to go to identify with the poor. And he did it for all of us. That on the cross, Jesus, who deserved acquittal and freedom, he received condemnation so that we, who deserve condemnation because of our sin, well, so that we could receive the acquittal that he wasn't given. It was the ultimate act of God identifying with the poor. He not only became one of the poor and the marginalized, not only did he become one of the neglected, but he stood in the place of all those of us in spiritual poverty and bankruptcy, and he paid our debt. Tim Keller tells a, a story of a, of a wealthy older woman who, who had never married, didn't have any children, no one to serve as an heir for her. She only had one close relative. He was a nephew who really hoped to inherit her money. He'd always been really gracious and attentive to her. He'd always taken good care of her. But she had heard some things about him that made her begin to doubt his genuineness. She was very rich, and she understood that, that the dispersal of, of, of her wealth was going to be a very big deal, and she needed to make sure that the person inheriting it would use it wisely and generously. And so she kind of took matters into her own hands. So one morning she, she dressed up in tattered clothes and she laid down on the steps of his townhouse and just waited for him to come out. And eventually he did, he came out, obviously did not recognize her, cussed her out, threatened to call the police and slam the door. And then she knew what his heart was really like. His response to the poor revealed his true nature. And the same is true between us and God. Why does God call us to provide for the poor? Because your attitude toward them reveals your attitude toward him. Your attitude toward them reveals your attitude toward him. A lot of people believe that, that the job of the church is just to, to preach the word and evangelize and build up believers, and absolutely it is that. But if care for the poor, as we understand it, if care for the poor is an inevitable sign of saving faith in Jesus, then it must be, and for us as Gateway Christian Church, it must continue to be a focus of our lives, both as individuals and together as a church. When we get involved in the lives of people, even for the purposes of evangelism and discipleship, eventually we are going to be confronted with their practical needs. And when we are, may, rem may we remember these words from 1 John chapter 3 that we actually looked at a few weeks ago in our last series. 1 John 3 verse 17. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Your attitude toward them reveals your attitude toward him. So what about you? What does your personal response to the poor reveal about you? I just want to let that question hang there for the rest of today. As you go about today, evaluate your life. Take a look. What do you, in how do you care for the poor? And what does that reveal about your attitude toward God? For some of you, you, you heard that question and it cut to the heart right away because you knew, you knew that, that you haven't been showing that care. And so for some of you this morning, you, you need to repent. And as we sing this song, you, you need to spend some time and say, God, my heart has been in the wrong place. And you need to ask him to, to continue to work on you and let his Holy Spirit work in your life to turn your heart toward the poor. For some of you, maybe this morning you saw him for the first time. 
And you recognized him on the cross as someone who stepped down into poverty on your behalf. And today's the day where you say, I, 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 I got to do it. I got I to gotta give my life to you. I got I to gotta put you in control and allow you to direct things. I, I need to put you in a place where, where you have say over who I am and what I do. And God, I want you to shape my affections because you poured out your love for me. I don't know where you're at this morning. But I do know that, that the, the way we treat the poor, it reveals how we feel about our Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your care and compassion for each one of us. But yeah, we talked a lot about the poor this morning, Father, but the truth is, is that we're all poor in one sense. They, they, God, we all have spiritual need. We're all spiritually poor before you. There's nothing that we can bring before you that will give us value. And yet you look at us and you say that we are your children. So thank you for that. God, continue to mold our hearts. Help us to, to look upon the materially poor in our world and to understand that those are the shoes you stepped down into. That, that when you chose to come to earth, that is the life you stepped into, and that is the life you lived, and that is the life you lived perfectly so that your sacrifice on the cross for us could take away our sin. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your love. Help us to show that to others. In Christ's name we pray, amen.